The Shure SM7B is an XLR dynamic microphone originally released in 1973 that sells for $400. The Shure SM58 is an XLR dynamic microphone originally released in 1966 that sells for $100. Now what happens when you cross an SM7B with an SM58? You get filled with MV. This is the Shure MV7, an XLR and USB dynamic microphone released in 2020 that sells for $250, and it is a very interesting microphone. This is a pretty long and in-depth review, so if you want to use the chapter markers to skip ahead to different parts that are more relevant to you, that's totally fine. But if you want to stick around for all of the dynamic puns I've condensed into this microphone review, feel free to do that as well. We're going to talk about a few things here, starting with the design and the build quality of the microphone, the features, both hardware and software, because software features are a thing with this microphone. We're going to talk about sound quality. I'll do some sound comparisons, and then we'll wrap up by trying to figure out who this microphone is for. Now, right now you are listening to the MV7 being run through the Rodecaster Pro on the generic dynamic mic setting with no additional processing. So this is as dry of an MV7 signal as I can get right now. And if we start off by talking about the design of this microphone, it's impossible not to notice that it looks very similar to the SM7B. It's not exactly the same. So if you're thinking this is just a USB version of the SM7B, it isn't, but it's impossible not to notice the similarities in design. And while the MV7 might be a little smaller and more rounded than the SM7B, the build quality is about the same. They're both made out of metal. They both have an attached metal yoke that lets you adjust the position of the microphone and connect it to microphone stands or boom arms. On the back of the MV7 is an XLR jack, a USB jack, and a headphone output. But I need to point out that the USB jack is a micro USB jack, which completely surprised me because I just assumed that this microphone released in 2020 was a USB-C microphone because that's what made sense. But of course, because it was released in 2020, that means it can't be perfect and it has micro USB, which to me is completely crazy. And I have a feeling the only reason they included that was to reduce costs, I'm guessing, including USB-C and a USB-C cable probably would have been a little more expensive, but it absolutely would have been more future-proof I don't like that I now have to have another micro USB cable to keep track of. However, I will point out that the cable that comes with the microphone, which it does include a micro USB to USB-A cable and a micro USB to USB-C cable, both of which are really long. So if you're using this microphone as a USB mic, it's very easy to position it wherever you need around your computer because you have plenty of cable length to work with. And another difference you might notice in terms of design is that the SM7B is very classic and understated in terms of branding, whereas the MV7 has a giant Shure logo right on both sides of it. And this ties into exactly what the intention is for this microphone and why it's so interesting also, because there are certain companies like Rode where over the past few years as podcasting and streaming have become more prevalent and really, really popular, they've doubled down on those markets. Rode has come out with multiple USB microphones, video mics that can act as USB microphones, the Rodecaster Pro, the Pod Mic, all of this stuff, all of these products designed for that specific market segment of people who do podcasts and live streams and that whole genre. Sure, on the other hand, found themselves in a really good spot because they've had these microphones that have been in production for decades and have been standards in the radio industry for decades. And now, you know, things like the SM7B are pretty ubiquitous among live streams and podcasts and YouTube videos, and sure didn't have to do anything to jump into that new market. But the MV7, as far as I know, is their first release that's dedicated to the podcast live streaming space specifically, which explains the very loud branding because they expect this to be a microphone that's going to be on camera. Now that has nothing to do with the quality of the microphone, of course, but I've seen multiple comments from people saying that they don't like the way the logo looks. So I thought it was worth bringing up. Now, because this is a USB and XLR microphone, you do have some other notable features. You might be able to see these lights on the front of the microphone. There is a touch bar, I guess you could call it, that lets you adjust the volume of the microphone itself. 
and the headphones when you're using it as a USB microphone. There's a switch to switch between headphone controls, microphone controls, or both like a mixer. And there's also a mute switch on the side. These controls only work when the microphone is being used via USB. If you only have it plugged in through XLR, these don't work at all. But they're pretty neat because they're very touch sensitive so you really don't need to put any kind of pressure on them to control the microphone, which means like if you need to mute it while you're recording, you can just touch the mute button very lightly and it will mute. Other USB microphones like the Blue Yeti, which I really like, and I think that's a great USB mic, have a physical mute button, which is very handy and it works pretty well, but sometimes the little click from the button definitely becomes audible in your recording or on your stream or however you're using the microphone. This one lets you be very gentle so that way you can adjust these settings without it becoming noticeable to your recording. And I talked about the yoke of the microphone that lets you mount it to a stand a second ago, but one thing that's very interesting is it looks shockingly similar to the one from the SM7B, but there's a pretty big difference, which is that the SM7B has this really cool feature where the bottom of the yoke twists independently. So you don't have to twist the microphone around to connect it to anything. You just have to twist this little end part to attach it to whatever you're connecting it to. And that's great because then you don't have to spin your very expensive microphone around. And it also lets you have the microphone connected to whatever cable you're using while you're attaching it to whichever stand you're using. But the MV7, on the other hand, looks like it has this exact same feature, but it does not. If you want to attach this microphone, you have to twist the microphone itself or twist the stand itself. Not a big deal, but just kind of annoying. The other issue I have with the mounting option is that they had the opportunity to do something very convenient and they didn't, which is on the bottom of the yoke, there's a mount for a standard microphone stand like these tabletop stands I'm using right now. But if you wanna use the microphone with like a boom arm or something that has a, I think it's a 3 8 inch connector, you need to use one of these little adapters which is included with the microphone. But these are a pain to use or a pain to take in, put out. The Rode PodMic has a similar connector, but the outer part is designed for that standard microphone stand. But inside, there's another diameter that's for that 3 8 inch connector. So if you're using this on a tabletop stand, you don't need an adapter. And then if you want to put it on something like a boom arm that has that 3 8 inch connector, you also don't need an adapter. And that is incredibly convenient. The reason I'm frustrated that the MV7 doesn't have that is because it almost does. It looks exactly like the pod mic, except the part of the microphone where they could have machined in some threads for that 3 8 inch connector. They just didn't. It's there. The diameter is there, but there are no threads. And so now you can't use it. I feel like that would have been a really simple feature to add that would have built in a lot of flexibility to this microphone. And then the other big thing in terms of design is the capsule itself. So if you look at the front of this microphone, trying not to ruin it while I'm speaking into it, it looks similar to the SM7B. The SM7B has its standard windscreen, which kind of clips in and then you have to unclip to take off. And then inside you have this metal housing and then the capsule in there. So it's very protected. It really works well as a windscreen because you have this metal grid plus the foam windscreen. The MV7 is entirely different. So this is where if you think this was just a USB version of this microphone, it's not. If I take off the windscreen, you'll see that this microphone looks entirely different. The capsule is really like a hybrid of the SM57 and the SM58. It's super robust and really well built, but it's definitely a little bit different. It doesn't reject plosives as well as you can kind of hear, pa, pa, pa. But it's just one of those things that shows you this microphone is definitely its own thing and it's not just an exact copy of an existing microphone. And that does bring me to the windscreen on this $250 microphone. It is a very cheap, cheesy windscreen that I don't actually even think works that well. It's not nearly as nice as the one that comes with the SM7B. In fact, if I can find it, you might have seen my video about the newer NW800, which is like the cheapest condenser microphone I could find on Amazon. This $25 microphone came with an ultra flimsy windscreen to go over it. It's basically the exact same windscreen as the MV7. This one has kind of been like in a cupboard for a while, so it's a little lopsided. But if I put the windscreen from my super cheap $25 microphone on the MV7, you can see it's almost the same as the one 
that actually came with it. I put the Shure one back on. It's not a big deal, but I wish it were a little more high quality, especially because if you're moving this microphone around, the windscreen comes off pretty easily. On the SM7B, the windscreen has this plastic clip on it, so when you attach it, it kind of clips into the microphone, and now the windscreen's not gonna go anywhere unless you want to detach it. But otherwise, this is a really well-built microphone that I think will last a really long time. I like the design of it. When you do have it plugged in via USB and the little lights are on, I think that looks kind of neat. It's definitely a more futuristic offering than we've seen before from Shure, and you can be sure about that. Get ready to hear that pun like 10 times in this video. So now that we've covered hardware, let's talk about software. I'm gonna get the SM7B out of here for just a few minutes. Don't worry though, it'll be back for some comparisons. Now the software, of course, as a USB microphone is where this starts to offer some new stuff that we haven't seen before from Shure. The first thing that you might notice is coming out of the microphone right now, I have an XLR cable and a USB cable and I am recording simultaneously. I don't think this is something I would use very often, actually outside of recording this video where I'm gonna wanna compare XLR versus USB audio quality, but it does give you the flexibility of, I guess, adding a little bit of backup. Typically, if I wanna back up an audio recording, I have the XLR cable going into the Rodecaster, the Rodecaster's recording, then I have that connected to my computer where I can also be recording there. So if I'm doing something really important that I wanna have a double recording of that's normally how I do it. It is very cool, that's a feature that exists, and if you are using the microphone via USB, then you can also use the headphone output to monitor your audio and your sound from your computer. I'm not doing that right now because I have my headphones running into the Rodecaster because I'm gonna bring in a couple other microphones in a few minutes to do some comparisons. Now there is an app called Shure Plus Motive that you'll need to download to get the most out of this microphone. There's a desktop version and a mobile version, but even though this is a USB microphone, and even though it comes with a micro USB to USB-C cable, it does not currently work with the USB-C iPads, but it does work with USB-C Android phones. So I think that's something that they're going to need to address in the future. And one of the benefits of having this app and having the software side of this microphone is that it can be adapted and adjusted and improved over time. They haven't done any updates yet, but I'm sure that they will in the future, maybe even by the time you're watching this video. Rode has done the same thing with the Rodecaster Pro. It's had numerous firmware updates since its release that have added in a ton of new flexibility and new features to the exact same existing hardware. I feel like Shure's probably gonna do the same thing. They're gonna go down the same road, you might say. Now right now you're listening to the signal of the MV7 through the Rodecaster Pro via the XLR cable. But what I'm gonna do right now is in the Motive app, I'm gonna switch to the automatic settings, and now we're gonna switch to USB now, this is the USB recording from the MV7. I didn't have to do anything in terms of switching this. It's recording simultaneously, which is pretty cool. And the automatic options give you a few different things to work with. You can save your own presets. It doesn't really come with any right now. You can mute the microphone, but you can also do the same thing here. So if I tap the mute button, untap the mute button, then it is unmuted. Since I'm set to automatic, the scroll wheel to adjust the volume doesn't work, doesn't really do anything on the microphone, but you can also mute the mic from right within the app here. And then the monitor mix is pretty interesting because this lets you mix what you're hearing in your headphones from the microphone via like how much of the playback you're gonna hear or how much of the mic you're going to hear. So if, you're, if you have sound effects, if you have music, if you have something else that you're recording your voice over, you can adjust that mix. Do you wanna hear more of your microphone? Do you wanna hear more of the mix itself? And that's some cool flexibility. And then the automatic equalization is one of the big benefits of this microphone. If you're brand new to this, it gives you a few really simple options. One of them is the near option, which is really about a few inches from the microphone, maybe like a fist's distance away. And then the other one is far. And if I'm right up on the microphone, you can hear how that has changed my voice a little bit. But if I lean back and kind of get away from the microphone, you should still be able to hear me pretty well, which means I don't have to be right on top of the microphone. Depending on your voice, your recording situation, that can be helpful. If you're working with someone who's not used to speaking into a microphone, you've got a guest on your podcast, people who aren't used to talking to microphones, 
usually don't get close enough to them. So it's nice to have this option. I'm gonna switch it back to near because I usually kind of lean <laughs> closer to the microphone. And then you also have tone options. So natural is kind of the most neutral option. Dark is gonna bring in some of that bass and then bright is going to get rid of some of that bass and go more towards the high end. And in fact, this might be a good spot to do a few comparisons. So I'm gonna switch this back to natural. Let's bring in the SM7B. So now I've got the SM7B running through the Rodecaster Pro and I've got the MV7 here. So this is the MV7 on near and natural. And this is just the dry signal of the SM7B. What I'm gonna do now though, is switch the MV7 to the dark mode. So now this should have bumped up some of the bass. The SM7B is pretty well known for having nice, rich, low end. And now this is what the SM7B sounds like alongside the MV7. So you can hear both of these microphones. Maybe we could even do some of the pop filter tests like Peter Pepper, pitched a podcast. Peter Piper pitched a podcast. Peter Piper pitched a podcast. You can also hear some of the directional rejection. If I turn the SM7B, I kind of stuttered there, you can sort of hear how it changes as I'm in front of the microphone or going away from the microphone. And the same is true for the MV7. I can turn it away from me and you can hear it's rejecting that sound. And if I turn it towards me, you hear more sound and it goes away and you hear less sound. And just for the sake of comparison, let's bring in a pod mic. The reason being that it's a much more affordable microphone at $100, but also because the pod mic tends to have a sound that leans more towards the higher end. So now on the MV7, if I switch it into bright, and then I also talk into the pod mic, now you can hear both the microphones. This is the pod mic, and this is the MV7. Sounds like there's still a bit more low end on the MV7, but they're not too far apart. I think they work really, really well together. Again though, $100, $250, that's a pretty big difference. And if you didn't watch my video, I do normally use the pod mic with this big WS2 windscreen. And that really helps reduce some of those plosives, but also reduces some of that high end. So now I think with this windscreen and the MV7 set to the bright setting, these two microphones pair together pretty darn well. Now I should mention, while you can't use the slider on here for controlling the volume when you're in automatic mode. If you hold your finger on the microphone slash headphone button for a few seconds, you can adjust that playback monitor mix. The orange represents the headphones and the green represents the microphone, so you can adjust that mix. I will say though, this little scroll wheel is not super touch sensitive like you would expect. It's more like a dial that doesn't actually turn. So it's not about swiping exactly where you want it to be. It's more about like continuously scrolling your finger over it until you get the level you want. I know that sounds small, but if you use this, you'll kind of see what I mean. It was a little confusing at first, but once you get the hang of it, it works really well. Now the automatic settings are great, especially the near and far positions because those kind of level out things automatically. But if you don't want to use those and you want to have more full manual control over your microphone. Then what you can do is you can go into the manual controls of the app and you have a lot more flexibility here. You have the same options to create and save and manage your presets. You can mute the microphone, but here you can also adjust the mic's gain all the way up to 36 decibels and all the way obviously down to zero. <laughs> I've been leaving it at about 33. And I should mention too, Maybe because this is a USB microphone, it does not seem as gain hungry as the S, it's definitely not as gain hungry as the SM7B, but it doesn't even seem quite as gain hungry as the pod mic. So while a cloud lifter via XLR will definitely boost the signal in a nice way, I think it's easier to get by using this microphone directly into something like the Rodecaster without a cloud lifter and still having plenty of gain and plenty of signal. And you've got the same monitor mix that we talked about before, which every setting that you adjust on the app also then shows itself on the microphone. You also have some EQ options that are very similar to the ones built into the back of the SM7B. There's a flat EQ, which doesn't really do anything. Then there's a high pass filter, which basically gets rid of some of the low end. Then there's a presence boost, which boosts more of the high end, which is kind of like where a lot of human voices tend to live. And then there's also a high pass and presence boost, which kind of combines both those settings together to create this sound. I don't know if you like it or if you don't like it, but this is what it sounds like. This is high pass and present. And then we go all the way back to just the flat EQ 
kind of how the mic sounds normally. There is a limiter, which is very helpful. It's not super noticeable, and I actually like this limiter quite a bit because I turned it on, shouldn't have really been able to hear anything, but if I turn the limiter off and I go like, ah, you should kind of hear, ah, it's so loud. <laughs> if I turn the limiter on and I go like, ah, it should try to compress that so that way you don't end up with, ah, like as much peaking as before. So if you're working with somebody who has a lot of volume shift in their voice or you're doing a podcast where you're just so hilarious and people are laughing really loudly a lot, you might wanna use that limiter. There's also a compressor built into the app. So this right now, the compressor is off. This is light compression. This is medium compression and this is heavy compression. So this is much more of like that traditional broadcast tone, I guess you could call it. None of these are better or worse. It's all up to how you're using the microphone and of course, just what you prefer and what works best with your voice specifically and just what you like. So this is heavy compression with a high pass filter and a presence boost. So this is a very like heavily processed signal. And then this is just the natural signal out of the microphone. One of the reasons I like the pod mic so much personally is because at least for my voice, it's the most natural sounding. When I record with the pod mic, this is what I sound like in real life. Other microphones, like the MV7, I might really like the way that they sound, but they almost make me sound better than I sound in real life. It's up to you, of course, what you prefer. I like the accurate sound, at least for my voice, of the pod mic. And again, very important to emphasize, each voice is going to sound different with different microphones. So just because something sounds good with one person doesn't mean it's going to be the perfect microphone for you, depending on what your voice is like. And that's everything you can do in the app. Now, of course, because this is a USB microphone, you can record directly into another application like Audition or GarageBand or Logic, and you can add equalization there. You can run it through the Rodecaster, add equalization there. So you have a lot of flexibility with your signal, but the app kind of puts it all in one place, especially if you don't have any of that other software or you don't want to dig into all of those crazy tools. I think the app is really like easy to use. And like I said before, because there can always be updates for the app, there can always be updates. You never know what kind of functionality could be added into the future. And the app is one of those things that's kind of a pro and a con for this mic, because on the one hand, it builds in all these new features. It lets you do all kinds of really cool stuff. You have all these controls on the microphone. But on the other hand, I'm always a little nervous when something is tied so closely to an app because while the physical microphone is built well enough to last forever for years and years and years, I don't know how long they're going to be developing this app. I don't know in five or 10 years if I'm going to want to take my micro USB cable and plug it into a computer and use this app or if I'll even be able to do that. But you could have bought an SM7B in 1973, which rhymes, and that microphone will still work today just the same way it did when you bought it. The XLR functionality of the MV7 will do the same. I think that will just keep working forever. But it seems like down the line, I don't know how long, five years, 10 years, 15 years, the USB functionality might not be as useful because there just might not be as many things to use it with. So that means you might have this USB microphone that has all these buttons and things on it that you literally just can't use. That's all speculation, of course, but it's something that makes me a little nervous when a device is tied so closely to a software app. So now let's talk about audio quality. And I look like I'm at a press conference from the 1980s. I've got a few things for comparison. Of course, the MV7 is right here in the middle. The SM7B is on my right, your left. And the Rode PodMic is on my left, your right with the big windscreen because I really recommend using the PodMic with the windscreen, even though it definitely takes away from the really nice aesthetics of the pod mic. I love the way that this microphone looks. And then you put this on it and it looks a little bit goofy, but it sounds really nice. And again, in terms of price, we're talking about $100, $250, and $400. All mics are being run through the Rodecaster Pro on the generic dynamic setting with no additional processing, including the pod mic, which has its own specific setting in the Rodecaster. I'm not using that right now. They're all being treated very equally. So let's start with the MV7, of course, because that's why you're here watching this video. I will say I've been using this microphone as much as I can since I received it. I've been using it in all my classes. I've been using it on live streams, podcasts. I really do love the sound quality of this mic. It's a 
great sounding microphone. Every time I hear a recording played back from it, it definitely sounds better than the way my voice sounded in my head, which I think is a positive thing. So the sound quality of this mic, I find just terrific and it's really clean. If I stop talking for a second, you can hear just how quiet the noise floor is. It's a pretty good sounding microphone. But the SM7B, of course, is pretty legendary as well. This is the just natural sound from the SM7B. You can kind of hear some differences there. There's no additional processing, of course. And for good measure, this is the Rode Pod mic again with no processing. And if you want to hear it without the windscreen, this is what it sounds like without the windscreen. But the reason I like that is because this does cut down the high end on the pod mic and it does definitely reduce those plosives. I'm talking across the pod mic right now, but if I talk directly to the pod mic, you're going to hear plosives. And of course, the same is true for the MV7. I noticed the plosives are pretty noticeable here at the beginning of this video when I kept saying the year 2020, the t, like I had to redo that like five times because I kept saying released in 2020 and you could hear the plosive. The SM7B, I think, is pretty good at reducing those plosives, like 2020, 2020. It's a pretty big difference there. And the reason for that is not just because it has a foam windscreen, but it has that metal grill under it, which also acts sort of as a windscreen. The MV7 only has this pretty cheesy foam windscreen. And the pod mic is supposed to have a built-in windscreen, which works okay. But once you put this big puffy windscreen on, nothing is getting through this microphone sounds pretty darn good. And now for no other reason than just curiosity, let's take the pod mic out of here and let's have a sure showdown, which is sure to be entertaining. It's time to hit the road, road. Just for right now, I promise I'll keep using it. Now I've got two more sure microphones here. I've got the SM58, which is $100 dynamic microphone. And I've also got the SM7, no, what is this? the SM57 in a giant windscreen. Last time I made a video about this, everybody recommended in the comments that I get the AWS81 windscreen, which I actually don't want to take off because it's really hard to put on. But this windscreen completely changes the Shure SM57 for vocals. It is like a $30 or $35 windscreen, so it makes this $100 microphone a $130 microphone. Now, of course, even though these are $100 microphones, they don't have built-in yokes or connectors or anything. They do come with a mic clip. And now this is the Shure SM58, which is just sort of the classic microphone. It's hard to go wrong with the 58. I think it sounds terrific. This is the SM58. Peter Piper pitched a podcast. This is the MV7. Peter Piper pitched a podcast. And this is the SM7B. Peter Piper pitched a podcast. The 58 is always a good option, especially if you're going to be using your microphone not just in studio, but potentially like out in public or on stage, or you want to do singing and talking and a whole bunch of different stuff. Not that you couldn't use these microphones are amazing also for vocals and singing and stuff, but the 58 is just sort of the all around workhorse, like renaissance man or woman of microphones. But let's then look at the SM57, which I have found so interesting with this windscreen. I think that with this windscreen, the SM57, which is normally very susceptible to pops and plosives, you can just like pa 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 and nothing is going to get through all day long. It also just rounds out the sound and makes it sound really full. So again, this is a $100 microphone with a $30 windscreen. This is the MV7. This is the SM7B, the Shure SM7B, and the Shure SM57. I made a whole video about these two microphones working together really well if you add a windscreen over here. Oh, and I should have, sorry, while I was using the SM58, I should have used its windscreen because it usually does come with a little windscreen. So Peter Piper pitched a podcast and Peter Piper pitched a podcast. Definitely makes a difference. Great for voice. Uh, th these windscreens too, if your SM58 doesn't come with one, they're really cheap, like $10 or something to buy. So you have all kinds of different options here. But what I wanted to highlight was just how these $100 microphones sound when compared with a $250 microphone or a $400 microphone. So let's just wrap up with all of these microphones here that we've talked about today, just for some reason, because there are so many microphones here right now. Where does the MV7 fit and who is it for? So it sounds great, it has a lot of cool features, but personally, 
I think that the $250 price tag is its biggest downfall. For $200 with all of that USB and app functionality, I think this would be a very easy microphone to recommend. $250 in the world of microphones isn't that expensive. There are mics that cost thousands and thousands of dollars. But the target audience for this is clearly somebody who's doing podcasting and live streaming. And most of the people I know in that realm are doing it on the side. They're doing it as a hobby. They're doing it for fun. They're doing it as a part-time thing. And $250 for a single microphone is kind of pushing it. I feel like a lot of people I know personally might want to jump the extra $150 and go for the SM7B or more likely spend less money and get something like a pod mic or if you want to stick with Shure, going with like the SM58 or the 57. For the price of one of these microphones, you can get two pod mics with the big puffy windscreens and have a perfect interview podcast setup. And these are only XLR microphones, but they're built to last a lifetime. And I think all of these Rode and Shure microphones are built to last as long as you need them to. But the USB functionality of this one, while being a huge benefit, is also the thing that might limit its lifespan or at least some of its functionality and usability into the future. But I think the person that this microphone is most ideal for is somebody who needs a single microphone as their all-around workhorse that sounds great, but they also use USB functionality and XLR functionality almost at a 50-50 split. Because if you just need a USB mic, there are so many great options in the $100 price range. Get a Blue Yeti, get a Rode NT-USB, something like that. Get the Samson Q2U, which is like kind of an SM58 that that has XLR and USB functionality. There's a ton of options in the $100 or under price range. If you just want an XLR mic, get a pod mic, get a 58, get a 57. There are so many options, again, that are cheaper. So I think that if you're going to spend the $250 on this microphone, it should be because you're going to use both features. And that is a realistic scenario. Maybe you use it as a USB microphone for your job or something while you're doing like teleconferencing. And then on your off time, you do a podcast or a stream and you want to plug in the XLR connector with some other microphones and use it that way. That actually makes sense. What I absolutely wouldn't recommend, unless you just love the sound so much, is buying multiple of these for a setup. So like I have my two pod mics as my podcast setup, and I did that specifically so that when I'm talking with a guest on my podcast, we can be using the same microphone and everything sounds the same. I wouldn't do that with this because then you're going to end up with two or three or four USB slash XLR microphones, and you're never going to use four USB microphones at the same time. With most computers, that's not even something that's possible to do, much less practical. So while this is a great mic in terms of audio quality, the price and the functionality make me a little confused about who it's for, but I still wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing these popping up in a lot of podcasts and a lot of live streams because it is a great microphone. And just for the sake of full disclosure, I'm very flattered when I get messages and comments from people telling me they decided to buy a pod mic or a roadcaster or something because I talked about it on my channel. I want you to know what I have and what I actually use. This SM7B is not mine. I borrowed this one. This SM58 is not mine. The SM57 is mine. I bought it in 2005 to record guitar amplifiers. The two pod mics are mine, of course, because I bought these and I talk about them all the time. The MV7 I did buy with my own money and I'm not returning it, I'm keeping the microphone. And I do have a Blue Yeti that I bought several years ago when I first started doing voiceovers and stuff on my channel. This is a $100 microphone. It's a great microphone. So those are the microphones that I own and have collected over the years for different purposes. The pod mic still is my main microphone. It's the one that works best with my voice. So if you did purchase a pod mic based on my recommendation, don't feel betrayed. These are still my main microphone, my favorite microphones. I am keeping the MV7. There is something about it that is very tough to put into like a video review. There's an intangible thing about this microphone that is very fun to use. Something about it, recording with it, setting it up, using it. It's just a really enjoyable mic to use. It's hard to communicate that through video. I might get some flack for this, but the SM7B, while a great sounding microphone, I've never like had fun using it or really enjoyed using it. It's just been a good, reliable tool. The MV7, there's something that just makes it fun. I don't know what that is. It's sort of this, I don't know, vibe. I guess, as the kids say, that just makes this a really enjoyable mic to use. 
And if this long video wasn't quite enough to show you what you need, I do have an entire playlist of microphone and podcast gear related videos that hopefully will help you figure out exactly what's gonna suit your needs the best. And of course, if you really like the Shure MV7, you can go ahead and grab one and make all of your friends envious.